This video will provide a brief history of the decipherment of Linear B, the Mycenaean writing system. It will be followed by a video which details the specifics of the writing system itself and provides a linguistic and cultural analysis of a number of Mycenaean documents which provide some insight into Mycenaean civilization. If you are interested in this topic, I recommend reading Michael Ventris and John Chadwick's original Documents in Mycenaean Greek, to which the information in these videos is largely indebted. These videos are the first in a long series covering the entire history of the Greek language and Greek literature. I plan to release a video or series of videos on every important period, author, and work from antiquity to the present. These videos will not only include relevant historical and literary information, but will also track the linguistic development of Greek, treating topics such as style, syntax, lexicon, register, morphology, and spelling. I will also produce a similar series of videos for Latin literature, and then for the major European language families, including Germanic, Romance, and Slavic. A rough outline of topics is in the description. The goal is to make a linguistically oriented approach to the Western humanities accessible to all. Mycenaean Greece refers to the civilization that flourished in Greece from about 1600 to 1100 BC. The civilization seems to have collapsed at around the same time as many other ancient civilizations around the Mediterranean, and the Mycenaean period is followed by a period called the Greek Dark Ages, during which large-scale cultural and economic production and complex social organization seems to have all but vanished. It is out of these Dark Ages, out of this cultural tabula rasa, that emerge the institutions and culture that we associate with ancient Greece. Before the thorough excavation of Mycenaean palaces and before the discovery and decipherment of Linear B, the Homeric poems, the Iliad and the Odyssey, were among the earliest documents from ancient Greece which preserved the Greek language at a relatively early stage of development. The Greeks themselves more or less accepted the heroes of the Iliad and the Odyssey as historical figures, or better said, they did not observe the same strict division between history and myth that we do today. Even when certain mythological aspects of the poems were called into question by philosophers and sophists, the Trojan War always remained an historical truth. The historian Thucydides, for example, one of the most critical and skeptical thinkers of antiquity, does not doubt the historical reality of the Trojan War, but only remains skeptical about the scale of the Greek expedition and conjectures that the Trojan War was likely much smaller than the Peloponnesian War. German scholars of the 19th century, however, believed almost without exception that the Homeric poems were merely fantasy and had no value as historical documents. This skepticism would likely have continued to our day had it not been for the dreams and determination of one man, Heinrich Schliemann. Schliemann was a polyglot and entrepreneur who, after making a fortune in St. Petersburg, first learned modern and then ancient Greek and devoted himself to archaeology. He had loved the stories of Homer as a boy, and he was convinced that he could use the Homeric poems to uncover the city of Troy. In 1871, after having received his PhD for a dissertation written in ancient Greek, he began his archaeological work and shortly thereafter uncovered what he called Priam's treasure, confirming the existence of a wealthy city at the exact location and time of the Trojan War. He later excavated the city of Mycenae, of which the famous Lion Gate had been visible since antiquity. The architecture, gold, weapons, and art which he found in the burial shafts at Mycenae, including the famous Mask of Agamemnon, all pointed to a sophisticated society very similar to the world described by Homer. Schliemann, in effect, had confirmed to the world that there was more truth in the Homeric poems than commonly admitted, and he had more or less founded a new branch of study. During his excavation, Schliemann found a number of tablets with symbols on them, but it was not until Sir Arthur Evans uncovered the palace at Knossos on Crete, along with thousands of writing tablets, that real work on the language of the Mycenaeans began. Evans correctly identified two separate but related writing systems and named them Linear A and Linear B. He understood that Linear A was older than Linear B, but never made much progress in deciphering either of the two scripts. He did, however, do much to help the study of Minoan and Mycenaean civilization by classifying and transcribing many of the documents he found. Yet even before Michael Ventris deciphered Linear B, it was possible to infer many details about obvious structural aspects of the language and the tablets. Since the Mycenaean script, much like modern Japanese, uses a combination of ideograms and syllabic characters, it was often possible to infer generally the content of each tablet. Here, for example, are the ideograms for livestock. Relying on these clues and on a systematic analysis of vocabulary, an American classicist named Alice Kober identified consistent patterns of inflection, and most importantly identified masculine and feminine variants of the same word. Later, from 1950 to 1952, Ventris began to circulate notes on the script among his colleagues. 
Among the discoveries of this period, he identified an enclitic conjunction, meaning and, collected data about the frequency of phonetic signs, classified the sign groups into categories, and was able to give a much more detailed account of the inflectional patterns discovered by Alice Kober, identifying singular and plural forms and distinguishing the nominative, genitive, and prepositional cases. While analyzing the structure of the script, he uses classifications and his analysis of the frequency of certain signs to begin guessing at the phonetic values of the signs. In June of 1952, two insights came together to lead to the decipherment of the entire script. First, he realized that Kober's inflectional patterns could be explained with reference to the Homeric forms of the masculine genitive singular in oyo and the feminine genitive plural in aon. Relying on this insight, he looked at the words assumed to be toponyms and realized that he could produce the names of important Cretan cities by consistently applying a given phonetic value to a given symbol. He then applied this pattern to other sets of signs and many Greek words began to emerge. For example, po me, genitive po me no, could be identified as poimen, or shepherd, ka ke u, as kalcheus, or smith, or i ere u, as hiereus, or priest. Thus, through the archaeological work of Heinrich Schliemann and Sir Arthur Evans, the efforts of Alice Kober and Michael Ventris, and the collaboration of hundreds of other scholars and archaeologists, the study of Mycenaean civilization was put on firm footing, and the world of the Homeric poems became much more tangible. Nevertheless, it must be remembered that Homer is a great poet endowed with a creative vision, and that his poetic vision of the Trojan War and its aftermath is by no means a historical account of actual people and the event. Rather, I like to think about it like this. Imagine that you're a bard walking around Greece at around 900 BC. You occasionally come across stone palaces built at an unimaginable scale, all of which are filled with art, weapons, tools, and wealth that you can barely comprehend. The technology, pottery, and production of your home village can hardly compare. Wouldn't you imagine that your land was once inhabited by a race of heroes of superhuman strength and power, a race who fought wars on a massive scale and quite literally walked with gods? To me, the Homeric poems, and much of Greek mythology, can be seen as an attempt of the collective unconscious of Dark Age Greece to explain the magnificent ruins of the world around them and to populate the barren landscape with semi-divine heroes worthy of such wealth and power.